The 21 year old woman goes missing on a cold winter's night while hitchhiking in a small remote town in Ireland. Was she the victim of a serial killer? I'm Sean and this is the strange disappearance of Josephine Dullard. Today's case brings us to the County Kildare in Ireland. It is a beautiful county and it is best known as the Thoroughbred County and the home of horse racing for its many horse racing courses and events throughout the whole county. If you find yourself in Kildare with money to spare, make sure to visit the outlets, home to 80 luxury boutiques in a beautifully laid out small village with some very nice cafes to relax after a long day of shopping or window shopping. The crime rate in Kildare is quite low compared to other counties in Ireland. So when the news came in a young woman went missing in a small town in Kildare, most of the locals were in disbelief, and rightly so. Josephine's case is widely linked to the missing women of the Vanishing Triangle and she likely fell prey to a man she took a lift off, who could also be linked to some of the other young women who went missing in the 90s. Of the cases we cover thus far of the Ireland's Vanishing Triangle, this one is most likely the work of a serial killer operating in the area in the mid to late 90s. So without further ado, today's case starts with a young woman named Josephine or affectionately known as Jojo Dullard. She was born in County Kilkenny on the 25th of January 1974, making her 21 at the time she disappeared. She was the youngest of five children and sadly her father John Dullard passed away before she was born. And to make matters worse, her mother Nora passed away when she was just nine years old leaving her and her four siblings behind. She had three sisters and a brother. The names were Mary, Nora, Kathleen and her brother Tom. It was just Jojo and her sister Kathleen who were still living at home in their cottage when their mother died. Leaving Kathleen only 19 at the time, the responsibility of raising Jojo. And she took on this role of mother and sister without a second thought. And Kathleen married her long-term boyfriend, Seamus Bergen, and they moved out of their cottage and Jojo would go with them. Jojo was described as a tomboy by her friends and her family. She had a hard life, but this didn't stop her from being a loving, caring sister and friend. On the 9th of November in 1995, it was a Thursday, Jojo was making her way back from Dublin to where she lived in Callan, County Kilkenny. She was a qualified beautician, but she left her job and she had started a new one in a local pub and restaurant called Dawson's. Before she landed this job in Dawson's, she signed on for social welfare. This is an unemployment payment which is given each week. It would have been about 80 Irish pounds back then as the euro was not yet introduced. For this payment you would have to sign on every month and Jojo signed on in Dublin and as she got a job she had to sign off the social welfare in person and this was the reason for her trip into Dublin that day. While in Dublin city Jojo looked around in some shops and she went to the Brussels pub, just off Grafton Street. It was the end of an era for Jojo, as she lived and worked in Dublin for over two years, and she wanted to celebrate with some friends before she went back to Kilkenny. When Jojo set off to make her way back home, she went to the bus station in Dublin. When waiting for her bus back to Kilkenny, she dozed off. And this would make her miss her last bus back to Kilkenny. But there was a bus going to Nace in County Kildare. And this would be close to halfway to her home. So she got on this bus with every intention to hitch a lift from Nace when she got there. Her plan would come together 
as when she arrived in Ace, she quickly hitched the lift. And she would get dropped off at Kilcullen, and from there she hitched again to a small town, Moon, which was still in County Kildare. And from here she still had 40 miles to go before she made it home. Moon is a very small town with a few hundred people calling it home. It has a church, a school, and a small community centre and one shop. And of course, it wouldn't be Ireland if they didn't have a pub. It was called a Moon High Cross Inn. Jojo was last seen making a phone call in a small phone box just after 11.30pm. This call was to her flatmate, Mary Cullinan. She told her she was going to try hitch a lift from Moon to Carlo, which was just 10 miles away. And there she would stay with a friend, and then go back home the next morning. She said she would ring her when she arrived to the next town. While talking, Jojo was trying to flag down cars, and she said a car pulled up. So she hung up the phone, and this was the last time anyone heard from Josephine Dullard again. She was last seen wearing black jeans, a black jacket, a white top with black shoes and a black rucksack. The next day the alarm was raised as Jojo never arrived to her job and her sister Kathleen, she reported her missing. It wouldn't be till the following Monday would the Gardaí take the report of Jojo gone missing seriously. In these three days, the suspect could have had time to cover his tracks and without attracting suspicion. And these vital days were lost in the search for Jojo. When the Gardaí made a public appeal, they would begin receiving sightings from the area. At the time she was last seen. A woman matching Jojo's description was seen leaning into a dark-coloured Toyota Carina. And the driver or occupants of this Toyota have never been traced. After this, there was another alleged sighting of Jojo. She was trying to hitch a lift in Castle Dermot Kildare, a seven minute drive away from Moon. This was at around midnight the same evening, 30 minutes after the phone call with a friend, and four separate people came forward saying they also seen a girl matching the description of Jojo at this location. There had been multiple alleged sightings of Jojo that night, and those were just a few. There was a report sighting of her being bundled into the back of a car in Kilmacow, three miles north of County Waterford. The taxi driver who came forward a year later, he said he was driving on the main road at Kilmacow at around 1.20am on the morning of the 10th of November and he's seen a red car with English red plates pull up on the side of the road. A man got out of the car to urinate, and suddenly a woman got out of the car with no shoes on, and she tried to run away, and she looked in distress. Within seconds, a second man came from the back of the car, he grabbed her by the hair, and dragged her back into the car, and they took off into the direction of Waterford. He thought it was best to mind his own business, but when he later heard of Jojo's disappearance, he came forward to tell the Gardaí. The investigating Gardaí remembered the night after a disappearance, and after the alarm was raised. They had arrested two English men in Kilkenny for breaking into phone boxes and stealing coins. They tracked them down to Portsmouth in the UK. And they learned at the time of Jojo's disappearance, the pair would cross on the ferry from the UK, travelling through Irish towns, robbing phone boxes. And when they were questioned, they couldn't account where they were and what they were doing when Jojo disappeared. They would travel in a car from town to town, so the guardie stripped the car they used and they found nothing. But they found the pair had checked into a hotel in Cork on the day of Jojo's disappearance and they called back home to England at 12.30am from the hotel. So this would unintentionally clear them from the investigation into Jojo's disappearance 
The pair nearly landed themselves the prime suspects of the case by robbing a few pounds from a phone box. Safe to say, they never attempted this again. The Guardi believed, despite the English reg on the car that was seen by the taxi driver, they may know the two men. And the men are Irish and part of a Waterford gang. The men were travelling through Moon that night. They are basically travelling criminals, one guard explained. He continued saying many of the answers they give are evasive. But that's more than likely because they don't want to reveal a separate crime they were involved in. The two men deny any knowledge of the whereabouts of Jojo Dullard. And the guard said and I quote, We need a confession or a body. We are definitely going to continue to watch these men. End quote. When detectives questioned the men Jojo hitched the lifts off, the first was questioned and released. The second man who gave Jojo a lift from Kilcullen to Moon also came forward, and he was released without charge. Gardy would then check who was around the area at the time, and a few people came forward. One man stood out. He was by all accounts politically related. And Jojo's family say he was very sketchy. And he gave contradictory statements to the Gardaí of what he was doing and where he was on the night of the disappearance. But the Gardaí could not find sufficient evidence to charge him or have a search warrant granted. So they had to let him go. And six months later, Jojo's family hired a private investigator to look further into this man. The investigator travelled to Wicklow and he went to this political man's house under the pretext of seeking directions to a nearby golf course. The investigator said he had a very uneasy feeling about the man from the get-go and he had a scar on his face which looked fresh and the investigator said it may have been done by a fingernail. The family have heavily campaigned for this man's private land to be searched, but with no success. Shortly after Jojo's disappearance, the family received a letter from a woman. In it, she explained she was the ex-girlfriend of the prime suspect. And she said he abused her, and that he was a very violent man and not to be messed with. Sadly, Jojo's sister passed away from cancer in 2018. And before her death, she said she would never forget that letter. It said you would not want to know what type of man he is. He is not the type of man you would like to know or meet. This length of time, we have, a, we have known in our hearts and accepted that she's not, she's not alive. And, because Joe would be the type of person that would, um, she'd phone you, she'd, um, she'd get word back to you some way and she, she never wanted, she wouldn't want to worry you. We know something sinister happened to her that night. Um, like back then people told me it was, it was a different Ireland back then and there were no mobile phones but she got to the phone box in Moon and it's from there we're trying to put the pieces of the jigsaw together and we know somebody has information and we were asked, appealing for them now today to come forward um, and help us. Maybe their circumstances have changed after all this time and we are praying that they'll find the courage and the strength to come, to come forward and reach out and help Jojo come home. We, we don't hold any grudges. The most important thing to us today after all these years is to bring Jojo home. Unfortunately, Jojo was in the wrong place at the wrong time that night. It could have been any woman that was picked up and murdered. But sadly, it was likely Jojo. And the man who'd done it, he is probably still out there. Walking on the streets and in front of us in shops. All the while living with this dark secret. And who knows what else this person is hiding. A lasting memory of Jojo in the form of a memorial stone was put up in the town moon where she spoke her last words to her friend over the phone on that fateful night. 
It lays there to this day in memory of Jojo, and is accepted and respected by the people of Moon. Hopefully one day, Jojo will be brought home to be buried alongside her mom and dad in County Kilkenny, where she belongs. Thoughts go out to Jojo's family and friends. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.